Oh, hello everyone. It's so wonderful to be here with you. It's my great pleasure to look at all your beautiful faces. Um, before I say the Fatiha today, I want to say something that I heard Fazia say in one of her Friday zikrs a few weeks ago. And it really, it's, I think of it every time I say the Fatiha now, and it, it moved me so much because one time, I think back when I was in school, maybe 20 years ago, we were doing an all night zikr and I was in the part where we were looking at the name of Allah for an hour in silence. And as I was looking at the name, all of a sudden it like, it was alive, it was like really alive. And it was like, a re I mean, it, it shocked me. I was just never experienced anything like that. So uh, Fazia said that Salima, no, fa no Fatima, who was, a Shadalia's teacher told him that the, that the Fatiha is a living thing. So ever since then, whenever I say the Fatiha, I think of it as a living thing because she said it comes down, it, the living Fatiha that comes to you will settle all over your body and bring you whatever healing you need. So that to me was so beautiful and I wanted to share it so that you can think of it whenever you do the Fatiha. And when, you, and we, when we do it right now, we'll ask Allah to please bless us with the living Fatiha and to bring us whatever we need from this teaching. So drive as deeply as you can into your hearts where we meet Allah, our Lord. And remember who, who, remember who God is. He's the all powerful, he's the loving, he's the compassionate, he's the merciful. He knows everything, he's in charge of everything. So just bow down your head before him and go as deep as you can to connect with him. And we call on the living Fatiha. Aoud Malahi Mina Shaitani Arajim. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbi Alameen. Arachman Rahim. Maliki Omidin, Yakana Buzawa Yakana Sain, Ethina Serrata Mustakim, Serrata Ladina Abdalehim, Hyrunic do be a lehim, Amen. Allah, my love of Allah, thank you so much for bringing us together and allow us to connect all of our hearts with each other. And <clears throat> pardon me that my voice is kind of scratchy and my words are not coming as easily today, although it seems better at the moment. <laughs> um, um, but I know Allah is in charge, so whatever, whatever, I hope it's not too annoying that my voice is weird. Um, <clears throat> um, so, when I, when Abdullah met Pat, asked me to give a teaching, I had just finished, I think, eight hours worth of teaching on relationship in my Saturday Sufi class. And, my, and uh, so I thought, well, I'll do something on relationships. Surely there's something in all that that I can use. And, um, and then I thought, oh, you know, what else? Uh, the other context is I had just had my 50th wedding anniversary. And I thought, okay, I'll just think about these teachings in the context of my relationship with my beautiful husband, Jeff, and uh, what I've learned from those years and how it relates to our Sufi understandings of relationship. So um, so we won't have a long time. It's just an hour is pretty quick. And we won't have a long time to, for me to actually do any process at the end, except for probably sharing what you moved, what you feel moved from your heart to share with us, to share your inspiration or your learning or whatever you want to share. Um, but what I would like you to do is to be in some kind of a process of contemplation during the whole thing where you choose a relationship. If you, if you have a marriage partner, that's great. But it doesn't matter. Any, any relationship, I would like you to choose a relationship where you have a growth pact. And if you could, I think that's, that doesn't need explanation. 
where you tell where you you and this other person you're with partner or child or whoever tries to help each other to walk or to grow and has a commitment to it. So I want to pause here for a moment to be in gratitude to our not only our partners as our teachers, but also our teachers. I'd like to thank all of our Sufi teachers who have given us many, many teachings on, on, um, on relationship. I'd like to thank especially Salima and, um, and Ibrahim, but also Noor and Wadud. They've taught me everything I've, probably a lot of what, you, what I may think to say here is from something I've heard them say. And in fact, some of the time you may hear Wadud's language and I'll, I'll, I'll point it out. Like when we can hear him speaking, you'll probably notice it and I'll point it out uh, when it's his words but they've taught us so much about relationships. Um, and also, oh my God, thank you. Thank, let's take a moment to feel gratitude for our children who, who teach us more than anything in the world. How many times have our children pulled out the be best of you by, they, they never stop protesting until you give them the best that you're capable of. And that is such a blessing. My first baby was not even conceived when she gave me the strength to stop smoking after many years of smoking, probably 20 years of smoking, many failed attempts. So um, before she was even here, she was helping me. Um, so, okay, so to talk about intimate relationships and whichever one you choose to look at. So whoever, the, whoever it is you're thinking of, Allah has given you this special person to help you and for you to help. The heart of your beloved, first of all, of course, is to, be is to be protected from injury. We can't help someone grow or heal if they don't trust you. I remember one time a dude gave a class and he, he had put a bunch of flowers in the middle of the room and he asked one of the students to go pick up one of the flowers. And they said, sure. And they went and picked up a flower pretty matter of factly. And, um, but then he gave them a chance to do it again after he, after he prepped them by asking them to say, in the name of Allah, I pick up this flower. That's such a sweet teaching. And it was so different when the person did it after, after saying in the name of Allah. It was like then they picked up the flower with the utmost tenderness. And Wadud said, well, you know, you wouldn't go into your garden and slap your flowers around. We, you know, we don't grab a flower, you know. Um, and this is how he wants it. He, he, was, he was templating for us to treat the hearts of all of our beloveds. And, and, one, and a practical thing, they said, you know, imagine what you're going to say before you say it, if you're not in a question, if it's going to hurt them, and then don't say it if it does. I think that's a, none of us are able to really live up to that. Um, but we could, something a little bit easier, it's probably a little more doable, is that when you're speaking then to your beloved, um, try to keep your eye on their faces and see if you, you know, so if you see a hurt look or anything pass over their face, a shadow pass over their face, you can say to them, oh, what just happened? I see something on your face. Did I say something that hurt you? You know, most of our parents were not emotion focused, meaning emotion focused parenting is when parents see emotion as important as an opportunity for intimacy. And they move toward their children to show interest and support. And they help them feel their feelings fully in their body. So let us not be satisfied with the job that our parent, our partner's parents did, but, but let's become emotion focused partner. So we treat our partners with gentleness and interest. And how about when we share, when we speak? Um, you, know, you know, with my children, I knew that my job was to make them the very best adults that I could. And I know that they wanted that too. And a good marriage is similarly based on a growth pact. Being kind and, and being kind to your partner does not mean not saying hard things. I'm thinking of, two, I thought of two examples that I give of when my husband um, said something kind of hard for me to hear, 
but it was very helpful to me. I learned from it. The first was when we were leading a backpacking camp together while we were in graduate school years and years ago. So we were driving back up Boulder Canyon to, the, to our base camp. And my husband told me that when I drink, that, well, I don't drink now, so, but, when I, but back then, when I drink at parties, I tend to act like a self-centered narcissist, asking people questions and not waiting for the answer. I guess it's like a Southern Belle thing, I don't know. But no one had ever given me feedback on that. But I thought, you know what, it sounds true. I was so shocked, however, at his saying something so negative that I remember really clearly having the impulse to jump out of the car like I couldn't stand that he said that to me. Um, so I was kind of, I was quiet the rest of the way back to the cabin. And uh, by the time I got there, I said, you know what? Nobody has ever told me that before, but I'm glad that I can trust you to tell me the truth. That felt really helpful. And, um, and, and it really was. Um, I don't know that I turned over a new leaf entirely immediately. Uh, it wasn't until I was in Sufi school that I actually stopped drinking, but um, it was still very useful feedback. Then a year or two later, it was other thing that was helpful for my growth. Now, when I'm, think, when I'm thinking, given these examples, think about your relationships and what you say or don't say or would like to say or you know, how, we, how, we, how we help each other with the truth. Um, so he said a couple of years later, he said, you know, I've been noticing something that I think I should tell you. When I get angry at you, I usually tell you, but I'm starting not to. Because whenever I do, I have to spend so much time making you feel okay that it's not worth the effort. I was going, oh my God. When he said this, I realized I've been shutting my partner down. I was shutting down his openness in our relationship and the depth of intimacy. I was shutting down his expression of what he was not getting and that he was needing. And partly shutting down at the same time his ability to be vulnerable when he was hurt. So I thought to myself, Okay, my commitment to Jeb is to help him be his true self and I'm shutting him down. So I'm not gonna do that anymore. The next time he expressed anger, I listened intently with an interested expression, not a hurt expression or frightened expression, with an interested expression as much as I could. And then I asked him, is that all? Anything else you wanna say? And then I made sure he'd said everything he wanted to say. And then I thanked him and I went into the next room. And I, I remember this so clearly sitting down. We lived in Dobie, Dobie Center right then because he was a floor counselor. We sat, I sat in that, in that picture, the corner window and thought, okay, well, did I survive that? How am I? And I realized, well, you know what? I'm just fine. There wasn't any damage done at all. I don't know why I thought it would be awful. I guess I had a picture of my own fragility uh, and, and it was just that, it was like, it just wasn't true. Um, so I know there are people here who've had past trauma and may be frightened, may tr be truly frightened of hearing people be angry. If that's the case, you know, we learned another thing in school. If you have trauma and you really are afraid and, and sometimes your partner is not in the best place and he actually is scary or she is actually scaring you, then you put the name of a lot over your heart and you don't let anything come into your heart except through the name. So nothing comes in that's harmful to you. And you wait until your beloved is in a better place where they settle down, where they can listen to you, where you feel safe. But, but until you do, you just keep the name of Allah in front of your heart. And you know we, we know that we don't just take anything that anybody says right into our heart. Okay, so another thing about talking to each other is about when to talk. Um, I also, I had trouble telling Jeb the truth myself when, um, when there was something to say. We were both in analysis for about seven years, just after graduate school. And I would leave my analyst couch um, knowing, you know, something I had discovered about Jeb and my analyst. I would say, I should probably talk to Jeb about this. And he'd go, yes. <laughs> so I would go home with the intention to talk to Jeb about it. And I wouldn't remember to. Or I would remember too, but I rem wouldn't remember what it was I wanted to say. Or I, I just couldn't get the words out. So Jeb and I started to write a list on the fridge so, and have a sit down every Thursday, every Sunday night. And I would look at the list before our meeting and I would still get fuzzy. 
or not be able to get my mouth to work. Or, or when I did, I was just sweating bullets. It's like I was really fearing that it would destroy our love. I mean, this says more about my original family, you know, right? I was afraid it would hurt the love irreparably. But, you know, it wasn't too much longer before I realized not only was it not doing that, it was bringing us closer. Um, and, you know, part of, part of this, what was beautiful about this was the commitment to do it because having that commitment, we weren't just getting together and shooting off our mouths to each other. We were really bringing our very best selves to the conversation. And that was like an early version of Sufi politeness. Um, so he heard me better than he did normally. And I spoke, you know, we both spoke to each other as well as we could. Um, and by the way, one of the Sufi teachings about relationships, you only tell people what they don't already know. So you don't say the same thing over and over again. Uh, but if they don't know it, it's, it can be actually very helpful. It's a mercy and a help to a friend to say, to point out a mistake that they made or something that you, you know, how you feel about something. Siddhi said to us one time that in 40 years of marriage with his wife, that he had never said why or what to her. He never questioned whatever she said to him. He just accepted it, listened to her. I told Jeff about this and he said, well, I think Siddhi just set a new bar for us. But if we hold ourselves to a high standard, then we'll be more likely to see the places where we can really walk or grow um, through our partners. So, so when we want to, we, you know, when we, when I came home from taking the promise, I thought, what did it mean I give everything for your face? I said that to Allah, but I, okay. And then I started thinking, oh yeah, except for this, 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 this. So that's the, that's the way our hearts are when we try to open them to God. We think of the things we, we still keep hanging on to, like the need to be right or to be in control. And the same thing happens when we surrender to our partners. You know, we, we say, I open completely to give and receive love, but this is why dude's language again. I'm not done yet with this particular grudge or improvement I have in mind for you. I think, yeah, that's, that's definitely my dude's language. I can hear him saying it. Um, so we're talking here about the, the growth of the nafs, the, the personality. And so that was where we were for quite a long time. Um, but I realized while I was at the university that it's not, it's not enough to make your partner's nafs happy. Um, and I realized one of the things I had learned in analysis that I was that I had a pattern of being pathologically accepting. I mean, I would let my my adored brother get away with anything. Um, but the teachers taught us that at a deep level, your partner won't be happy unless you get what's actually needed at the deeper levels of, in the heart and the soul. You can't just make the naps happy. If you continue to let, relate just self to self, you're actually hurting them. So I think this is Nura's language. When the honeymoon is over, the relationship either goes deeper or dies. So we want to go deeper. Relating from the heart. Now, what is that? Um, so, you know, so in, in analysis, I stop treating my husband like it, an overindulgent mother would treat him, ignoring immature behavior when we both grew from that. But then we began to think about how to take care of each other's hearts. It's not only about um, not being hurtful, it's also about taking love from each other and letting each other give you, letting the other person give you love. So there was a powerful shift that happened to me one time. I just didn't know how to really receive fully interpersonally. Um, one time I went to a party where there was a person who was really important to me and they, they were, I felt really rebuffed and, you know, really came home feeling deeply depressed for the first time. And I got in bed facing the wall and I was very busy falling down a deep, deep well and, and not really paying attention to Jeff's hand on my back. He was just lying there with his hand in the center of my back. After some time of falling down the hole, I became aware, oh, he's still there. Jeff's back there. And I thought, I wonder if this is making me feel better. Actually, it is a little bit. 
then I thought, maybe I really need to take it and maybe I need to really turn over and let him hold me. And it was so hard from, from that coming out of that well to really turn over and put myself in his chest and let him hold me. But you know what? In like two minutes, the whole thing had lifted. It's like, <laughs> there we were back together and I felt fine again. So anyway, so letting, really trying to support each other and care for each other when people are upset is so deep, it's so wonderful. And it's so helpful learning how to receive love and support when you're in pain. And then here's an example of how we learned not to treat each other's hearts. Um, one night we were we had run our backpacking camp and we had we we had we had worked so hard closing up after the backpacking camp was over and everybody had gone home. We were driving back to graduate school and we were with another couple who were close friends. And we ran into a typical male female clash. My girlfriend and I wanted to stop and get some sunflower seeds to eat in the back of the car. And the guys had the mindset of driving straight through and didn't want to stop. So they refused. That made us perfectly furious that they got to the side because they had the wheel. And this got really crazy. And we ended up, we ended up pulling over so that Jeb and I could run around in a field yelling at each other. When we got back in the car, we were both wondering, who is this person I married? This is not who I married. I never knew this about them. So we got in and, and after some time, I started to try to talk to Jeb because I started to get a sense that he was worse off than me. He seemed really frozen and he was. You know what, it took almost a week for him to really feel like himself. I had really traumatized him. And I was a little traumatized, but not as much as him. The way we summarized our learnings about this was let's don't ever go crazy both at the same time. Um, also another related thing is everyone has crazy spots and you have to act, you have to assess who's the most crazy at the time, at the, any given moment, who's most crazy if, you're, if somebody's crazy or you're both crazy. It's kind of like, you know how you have a new baby and you kind of know who's most tired and who should get up when the baby cries. You just know. Um, so you know who's, who's in most trouble when you both feel crazy. So um, we, over time, we've learned to appreciate that these crazy spots are from deep emotional conditioning. When they come, when, when our crazy spots hook up with each other, we can call it role locks. We can call it projective identification. We can call it emotional schemas, whatever, however you think about it. It's these patterned ways that two people hook up together. Um, we, need to, we need to not give up on changing those patterns, but at the same time to, to, to know it will take time. These are not easy. And people can't, you just can't tell people have to be logical and change it. Being logical doesn't help, it's emotional learning. Um, and only a new emotional learning will have effect on the patterns. As children, this is psychological speak for a second. As children, we're faced with certain challenges, what we're dealing with in our parents and our world. And we figure out how's the best way to behave so that we don't get hurt. You know, we learn, it really feels true that I need to never be aggressive or to always be aggressive or to be docile or to lie or to never be successful. All these things we can learn about how to get along in the world and not get hurt. Um, and it just feels true that we need to be that way. So the best template I know for changing this kind of implicit learning is to, ex is to have it fully vividly activated, like to make it conscious. And at the same time, to have a vivid experience that disconfirms that experience. This is the work of Bruce Etker, if you're any of your therapists. If the brain holds these two together and they're both, they're both vivid, it can, rewrite, or it can rewrite, overwrite early emotional learning. It's not just, I'm gonna leave that and go to where I, like another planet where I know how to be, have a different experience. No, it's actually erases the early experience and they're discovering that we can actually do that now. We thought it, we thought it couldn't happen. So when the crazy spots are out, fighting doesn't work but new emotional experiences does if we are patient and we take it seriously. 
And we try not to think things like, oh, if, if he or she really loved me, they would never act this way. Because you're just digging yourself into a hole and you're, you're not appreciating how hard it is to not be you, um, to not do what you learned to do for your own survival. Um, so one of the principles here is that you can't be so inside yourself that you aren't paying attention to your partner. This is crucial in marriage to be able to put yourself aside temporarily, knowing that you will get your turn. You will get to be the listener uh, eventually. I mean, you will get to be the listen. You will get listened to eventually. Um, even when you're in turmoil yourself, you can give care to the other person. So you try not to say to yourself, I'm so upset that I just have to say this, and this trumps everything. So I just have to say this, because um, you'll miss your chance to really help your partner when they're in distress. And if you help them, then they'll be, become who you want them to be and they'll be able to help you. So this start, starts happening naturally when you're relating on the level of the heart because the heart is softer, more gentle. And don't think you're not doing anything if you're containing the other person's heart. If you're holding their heart, listening to them, not judging, staying open, maybe they're not in a good place, you're sending mercy and love, it is the medicine that's needed. And it's not an example of being passive or weak. It's, it's exactly the right thing to do. So um, in the university, I learned that when we get to the heart level, when we walk to where, to where that's actually our station, then, then we become more selfless. The relationship is no longer about meeting our needs, but serving others to help. We wanna help people. Actually, it's a need to serve love itself. I can hear Nura's voice here, Nura Laird. At the level of the heart, you have a need to be in the personality, but, your part, but, if, but when your partner's in distress, you can put your need on the back burner and serve love. Nura told us that in her experience, less than 10% of couples actually get to this level. At this level, you can do what's best for the other. You can do what God wants you to do. And a relationship, of course, can become a triangle with God as the third if your partner's in this with you. Uh, when you have discard, you can both turn to God. That's really a lovely thing. Um, and at this level, you begin to feel the godly qualities coming in like generosity. Generosity, by the way, is one of the, to, to Jeff and I have always felt like generosity is one of the most important things in a relationship because it begets generosity. It begets open-heartedness, it begets giving. The more you're generous with the other person. But I will tell you a story that really made such an impression on me. Um, see, yeah, we were running our backpacking camp and we were taking a pre-camp session um, hike with one of our camp staff. And we had gotten dropped off in this beautiful valley from a train. We had thrown off our packs and jumped off and started walking up this really big mountain. And we'd walked all morning, all day from early morning till it was probably eight o'clock at night or something like that. And um, about an hour from the top of where we were, where we were, at, where we were headed, all of a sudden I had this horrible sinking realization that I had left my mouth brace at the creek where we brushed our teeth in the morning. Well, we were still in graduate school then and my brace cost $100 and that was too much for us to waste or leave behind. We just couldn't do it and I knew we couldn't do it. I was probably stammering when I told Jeff what I had done and he looked like shocked for a second, just a moment or two. And then he quickly said, well, you guys go on up ahead and, and, and make camp. I think you can find the place. Here it is, and I'll show you where it is on the map. And uh, I'll run down and get it. Because I was like, I couldn't believe it. What was so beautiful about this is since he was a backpacker and he knew that I could not go back and get it. You know, we, my first hike ever had been while we after we started this camp. We knew it would have to be him if it knew he was going to go and get it. So. He took me quickly out of the hell I was feeling. I mean, it was horrible, that place I was in. Um, and um, he didn't even take one moment to express the chagrin he must have been feeling. He didn't roll his eyes. He didn't do anything. He just, he just had one moment of shock. And then he said that. 
So this is such a vivid moment for me. The depth of my gratitude for him was so big. And I told him, you know, you earn more that day. You'll, you'll, you could ride on that for years and years and years. And it made me feel so generous toward him. Generosity begets generosity. So, you know, we've been talking about the NAF level and the heart level, we began to care for each other's hearts and NAFs. Um, but, you know, what happens when an issue, we're gonna talk about how you go into the soul then. When, it, when we clean an issue, when a picture annihilates, you know, the, what is it? The picture is a veil and behind the screen is a lock. So when the picture annihilates, it leaves a momentary hole or a vacuum. But a lot doesn't leave that vacuum, but immediately fills it with a divine quality. So here we are helping each other arrive at the soul. Whenever we see something in our relationship, when we clean it, some a beautiful quality of a law comes in. And then we're, we're, then we're pretty soon we're walking in mainly in the soul stations. Uh, one of the marks of when people are, walk, are walking in the soul stations is um, that they're not even really dealing with their partner anymore. They, they, when there's an issue, their partner actually gets to walk off the stage and there's only God. Because um, after all, God sent you your partner to be, a mirror, to, mirror, to be a mirror, to show you yourself. It's a deep knowing that your experience in any relationship is not about the other person even when it really looks like it is. Whatever triggers you in your partner or your friend, it's because of your pictures. This is the only way to work with relationships, the only thing that can move you through the deep problems. Here's, the, here's my dude's language. Couples, cu couples, sorry, couples cross into a much better realm when they stop trying to change each other. God didn't give you that job anyway. Even if you can't bring yourself to, in the heat of the moment, to believe the statement, I'm telling you, it works. If you act as if it's true, it will change your life and your relationship. So you know, if you're in a relationship that you can't stand or you feel stuck in, or your partner isn't growing, or he's abused, he or she's abusing you, I believe that doing, the, doing it why dude's way you will find relief when you walk through the places in yourself that cause God to put those people in your life. And once that purpose has been served and you've developed the quality that you need, Allah may find a way to help you out of that relationship that you no longer need or, a reaction, or your reactions to your partner may change so much that the relationship is no longer painful. So, if you're looking out at your partner from the level of the soul, you can keep witnessing the beauty even when hard things are happening. On the level of the soul, we go, we get to leave behind the melodrama. We get to leave behind the pictures of our fragility. We get to leave behind our entitlement, our fear of others, all those things, even when we have made shrines of them. We don't take too seriously what seems to be happening. We become aware that Allah is right behind you, listening, helping, and loving you. When you're witnessing your partner's soul, you're seeing only beauty. And it's wonderful for them to be witnessed in their beauty. It strengthens their beautiful qualities to have it witnessed. So pay attention in your relationship and think of the, re the relationship that you're thinking of. Think for of a moment, when you look at this person, that God gave you, where are you looking? Are you always aware of them in depth from your soul to their soul? If you are, then your essences begin to move together to deeper and deeper states of love. Very beautiful. And Sidney wrote in some of his books about how this, this Begins, begins to be a circle of giving, receive it. Like when you give and the partner gives and you give and partner give, it's like a, it's like a figure eight. 
it's like it, it goes faster and faster. It actually spins couples up to a law and to the unity. It actually helps you walk faster in a couple than you can on your, on your own. <clears throat> okay, so the fourth level, well, there's not a lot to say about the fourth level because on that level, we dissolve into God and you're sitting in the absolute reality. There's no differentiation, no, no qualities, not even an I or you, no gender. It just is. Um, so that's about all I have to say about that level. Um, now I want to do an exercise. Uh, and I want you to put this person inside you. I mean, in front of you, sorry, this person that you're working with inside of you, this relationship that you've been contemplating. Uh, put that person in front of you and really picture them. You can picture them in their worst self if you want to. But I want you to go to the deepest place in your heart that you can reach to look at them there. You can look at their clothes, you can look at how they stand, how they walk, how they dress, what language they use. So even if you're imagining them not at your best, I want you to try to look at them from the deepest place in your soul that you can reach and imagine that you can speak to them from that place. And I'm gonna speak, I'm gonna, I want you to imagine that you could speak to them as Hafiz speaks in his poetry. So put them in front of you and you're looking at their eye, outer, sorry, their outer self, but you're looking from way deep inside. And this is what Hafiz would have to have you say to them. There is a beautiful creature living in a hole you have dug. So at night, I set fruit and grains and little pots of wine and milk beside your soft earthen mounds. And I often sing, but still, my dear, we do not come out. I have fallen in love with someone who hides inside you. We should talk about this problem. Otherwise, I will never leave you alone. Here's another thing that Hafiz might say to your partner when they're in their naffy selves. You don't have to act crazy anymore. We all know you were good at that. Now retire, my dear, from all that hard work you do of bringing pain to your sweet eyes and heart. Look in a clear mirror See the beautiful ancient warrior and the divine elements you always carry inside that infused this universe with sacred life so long ago and join you eternally with all existence, with God. And see how it is to speak with your beloved in that way and see if you can now notice how your beloved feels when you say that, when you speak to them that way. What's the effect? How is it for them to receive that, that way of speaking, that way of feeling? See what it does to your relationship. And now you can continue living, looking at your beloved, but look even deeper, look at their soul. If they have a Sufi name, can you see that name? See that name, how they carry that name? If not, can you guess what their name would be if City had named them or if they got a name now? And speak to their soul as Hafiz would speak to it. Speak, speak, speak like this. Do you know how beautiful you are? I think not, my dear. For as you talk of God, I see great parades with wildly colorful bands streaming from your mind and heart, carrying wonderful and secret messages to every corner of the world. I see saints bowing in the mountains hundreds of miles away to the wonder of sounds that break into light from your most common words. 
Speak to me of your mother, your cousins, and your friends. Tell me of squirrels and birds you know. Awaken your legions of nightingales and let them soar wild and free in the sky and begin to sing to God. Let's all begin to sing to God. Do you know how beautiful you are? I think not, my dear. Yet Hafiz could set you on a stage and worship you forever. In this experience, speaking from the deepest place to your beloved that way. What that's like to relate. And now with your beloved still before you, allow yourself to disappear and merge with the law and with your beloved. There is no difference, there is no separation. And hear what Hafiz would say to you both. Little by little, you will turn into stars. Even then, my dear, you will only be a crawling infant still skinning your knees on God. Little by little, you will turn into the whole sweet amorous universe in heat on a wild spring night and become so free in a wonderful secret and pure love that flows from a conscious one-pointed infinite need for light. And then my dear, the beloved will have fulfilled just a fraction, just a fraction of a promise he wrote upon your heart. When your soul begins to ever bloom and laugh and spin in eternal ecstasy, oh, little by little, you will return to God. So feel again your partner from this place. So remember in a relationship, we have a chance to be together, to walk together, or we throw it away. Here's one dude's words again. Most people give some, but not everything. If it's partial, your life is like drinking lukewarm tea. Let's just hear them. So here's a prayer for all of us. Oh Allah, please help us to meet your highest decree that you have for us through this and other relationships. Help us to bow down our thoughts, our minds, to put down our pain, to be the real love to those he has given us to love. So, what I would like to do, we have 15 minutes left almost, and I would like to see, I'm hoping that you have had some, some learnings or some tajalis or some inspiration or some things you want in your relationship with your partner or some memories of ways that your partner has been wonderful to you the way Jeff has been wonderful to me. Um, so there might be some things you could share, some things you could teach us. So does anybody want to speak from their heart uh, to the group? And Abdullah Pat, oh, he, Abdullah said that you could just unmute yourself and speak if, if you would like. Just go ahead and un unmute yourself if you're calling on from a phone, uh, star six. Anybody got anything to share, any thoughts or reflections? Assalamualaikum, it's Layla Malzer. Oh, hey, Layla. Hey, beloved. Assalamu alaikum. Wonderful, beautiful, beautiful, humbly law. I was thinking of a time when um, Joel and I had been engaged. This is like 25 years ago, and my father died, 
and I went through all kinds of internal upheaval, you know, as, as, uh, as I found you go through upheaval with, with your partner when one of your parents dies often because everything shifts, all the pickup sticks are up in the air. And it's, of course, it's a great opportunity to walk, but we had ag agreed on buying a house together and, um, and I was just, my innards were in an uproar and there was just no way that I was ready to buy a house with anybody and I just needed time to let things settle. And, uh, but we had had scheduled a meeting with the attorney to, to pay for the house, you know, to, to, to sign the contract. And I was like, I can't do this right now. So Joel, um, and he had, hadn't liked this house the best of all the houses we looked at. Joel, you know, he went ahead, he called from the attorney's office. Are you sure? I was like, yeah, I am sure. And he went ahead and got that, bought the house anyway, because he knew that I would come back. And it makes me cry to just think about the the depth of understanding that he had. I I wasn't I wasn't sure that I didn't want to be with him. I just, you know, I was I was a moving target at that point in my emotions. So I, there's no way I could know. And he just went ahead and bought the house anyway. Uh, and then apparently I did come back because here we are. <laughs> but. I, yeah, I appreciate his abidingness. Yeah, abiding. That's Very abiding point. man. Mm -hmm. Thank God. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Lila, for sharing that. Alhamdulillah. Feeling the depth of commitment that he had to you and the, and the knowledge and the holding through the ups and downs, through the craziness. By craziness, I presume you mean emotional upheaval and not certified mental illness? Not certified mental illness. No, I'm talking about the kind of craziness I was talking about, you know, where you you, you just get hit stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Normal craziness. Oops. I'd like to share um, gratitude that um, when my beloved and I met, um, we were given something very special because you know, most relationships start in naps and start in, in infatuation. And we get, to, we got to skip right over that because like, like four days after meeting, we, we, we had this experience we were, we met on the land and we were like deep in our souls in a way that I had never experienced before. Um, where like, you know, like we, we went for a walk on the new land and, and suddenly we were just like, you know, really some, some, something opened so wide and I, and it was, it was remarkable. I remember, you know, walking back from that, just being just astonished that, you know, at 47 years old, I could have this totally new experience that was unlike anything I'd ever experienced before. And it opened the doorway. We've been together for the last 11 years and it's been amazing. It continues to open. Mm. Beautiful. What a blessing. Anyone else want to share something? Just go ahead and unmute yourself, if you would. Assalamu alaikum, Saida. Who is this? This okay. is Amina. Oh, hi, Amina. Hi. Um, Thank you so much. This was really beautiful. Um, I just had a question about your teaching. Um, you said something about when you bring these two parts together, then it can like kind of override the emotional programming or something. Could you repeat that part? What the, what the two parts yeah. are you were saying about bringing together? Yeah, it's, it's called coherence therapy. It's, it's basically saying, that your mind can actually detect a mismatch, like something is not fitting here. Like, oh, I really believed this was true. Oh, but I now have this other experience where I really know this is true. I really know that this is not true and this is true. And then you bring them together and your mind can detect a mismatch and can kind of go, it, it, it's really interesting to see a patient do that because 
It's like they feel, dis they seem disoriented. Sometimes they burst into tears. Sometimes they feel spacey or they, they go out and then come back. But, but it's, it's actually kind of a, something really kind of blah, 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 blah inside and changes because you've actually put the, the experience, the knowing, the emotional knowing, uh, the new emotional knowing with what you thought you knew and it, and it changes it. So, you know, I think we used to think that that kind of like, especially like pre-verbal uh, learning was not changeable because we couldn't get to it. And because and in therapy, in therapy, people could have a bad place where they can be this self, but then they can kind of leave that self and and learn to have a whole different experience. But that's not the same thing as actually erasing the original. That's like, but can, then you can have these bad things. Then that stuff is still inside, ready to be activated at some other time. We're talking about it's possible even to erase it. So it doesn't, so it's not even there anymore. And that's what coherence therapy is trying to address. If you're a therapist, it's Bruce Ecker. Did that, did that answer the question? Yes, thank you. And it's, I think what I'm taking from this is that if there's a place where I get triggered by my beloved is to first sit with that trigger and look at what, you know, what is the old patterning for me, what I, you know, what I have believed about that, you know, what my voices and my pictures are about that. And then if I can go to Allah and receive from him, you know, the, the truth through his reality and then bring those together in my heart so that, um, yeah. you know, that the light of Allah can, can really wash the, the, um, the yeah. pictures and the voices of what I've believed to be true that really isn't true. Is that yeah. kind of it's capture very, it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We can, okay. We can actually wash it so it's not there anymore. No. Okay. It's, uh, you can't do it by ignoring the bad stuff. It, you have to be experiencing it. And we know that in healing, you have to touch the place where the problem is and then bring a lot to it. Yes. Bring the new, the new experience. And, and, you know, the, the super healing is the most powerful. I mean, you know, if you get conscious of a place, like you have a schema, like a belief that something is true, you have to be a certain way. If we have a schema, um, um, I just forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> I went in two different directions now. I can't find where it was. Um, well, it, it, I was thinking about how it's, it's, it's the Sufi healing is that. It really is that. You're, you, you're becoming conscious of what it is that's not right. And then you're opening to the new experience. And a lot has the most incredible way of giving us a brand new experience that's so different than what we've experienced before. So it's like holding those two things together in the same cup until they begin to intermingle. Mm -hmm. Sometimes okay. you're going from the pain to a lot to the pain to a lot, but you hold them both together. And that's, the, that's where the magic happens. Yes, yes. Alhamdulillah, I have the um, blessing of participating in a healing retreat um, this, over the spring past spring and um one of the gifts that Allah gave to me was really helping me to be able to more easily see the veils as the veils and Allah as Allah and um <laughs> and you're talking about kind of channeling my dude's voice here I can hear him saying in our healing retreat it's like you know whatever you think it is you can go to Allah for a second opinion <laughs> and <laughs> so um yeah, so when we, when we have the capacity to be able to really look at what it is that we have presumed to be true from past experience and then, you know, look, really be able to see that as our veil and look at it and then turn to Allah and see what is, Allah's opinion is about this, then it can really help things shift. Mm -hmm. oh. Thank you so much, Nina. Yeah, thank you. Oh, Sidney, this is Rahima Reitenbaugh. And I just wanted to say that when I came back from healing school in 2004, I had had these experiences and I knew everything you were saying was true. And I was so excited. And I went to talk to the psychologist in the psychology department about how this was permanently changed. And they told me it was impossible, <laughs> that it couldn't happen. 
-hmm. it didn't exist anyway. So I'm a scientist and about a year or two later, I was reading in Science Magazine how they had had rats who they could now instantaneously change the memory. And I was just like, yes. Yeah. You know? This is exactly what started um, at yeah. Korea is on that path, Bruce at Korea. Yeah. We had that same study and started. Yeah, and so we were doing it ahead of time. And I, you know, and I, and for you to be saying to all of us here, I think it's really wonderful that yes, in fact, the memories are really gone. They're really permanently changed. Uh -huh. And we now know that from all sorts of science and you know some of us who learned it is just oh that's Sufi healing but uh -huh. it's really profound and so I'm so glad to hear you say that so thank you. Thank you so much Rahima. We have one one minute more. Just thank you so much for coming and I guess we're going to take a break in just a second. Oh, right now, and um, have a bathroom break and just for a minute and then come back together. Hopefully we'll come back together to do, to remember God together. Inshallah, we will. Thank you for a wonderful teaching, uh, Saida, and we, we all of us appreciate it very much, so. Thank you so much. <laughs>